The one we're moving from Ephesians now into uh, the book of Philippians. And we're going to go to chapter 1. Uh, we're we're going to uh, skip over verses 1 and 2. Uh, Brother Mark read those already. We're just going to read 3, 4, 5, and 6. Amen? Amen. 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 If you have it, if you have Philippians, uh, say, I got it, preach it. If you don't, Philippians is the 11th book in the New Testament, right after Ephesians. So if you mark, bookmark anything from last week, we go right to it. Amen. Amen. But I want everyone to have it. When you got it, say, I got it, preach it. And I'm Bible ready. And I'm Bible ready. Amen. Let's read together. Beginning at verse 3, the Bible says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making requests with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. That is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated in the presence of God and praise God. Yes. Praise God. Let us pray. Son of God, our Father, our Healer, our Redeemer, and our Provider. Oh, we come right now just to say thank you. Thank you, Father God, for another opportunity to stand behind this sacred desk. And Father God, while I'll be the one with the mic, Father God, we want you to speak. We want your people to hear your words and hear what you have to say to us on this point. And Father God, be a fence around us. And Father God, give us something that we can take from this place to fight the wiles of the enemy that are so abundant in our uh, various places of work and community. So Father God, we just ask you to bless the word that the word of our mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and just that you are my strength. And my redeemer, this I pray in Jesus' name. Church, say amen. Amen. Now, beloved, here at Greater Harvest, one of the things that we try to teach are the connections in the Bible. Last week, those of you who went with us to deliverance, connected the 121st Psalm. 2 Samuel, the 11th and the 12th chapters. So, in order for us to, to, to properly understand the word, it helps us to know the purpose and the time, the circumstances with which the word was written. The book of Philippians is another prison epistle. And Paul writes this letter with the intention of encouraging the church at Philippi. Paul, one of the things that we admire about Paul was he was able to inspire and instruct even while he was incarcerated. Paul didn't allow his circumstance to inhibit his work. And one of the reasons we are so greatly admire Paul was that he didn't allow his ministry to be halted even when he was arrested. And at the time of this writing, the church at Philippi was infiltrated by some false prophets preaching a false doctrine that was causing them to be conflicted. Beloved, even in the Bible days, there were those who used the church for their own private agenda. And these Judaizers came to Philippi after Paul left and told the Greeks who believed that in order to have salvation, they had to be circumcised and they had to obey Jewish law. And this, beloved, discouraged the believers and it went totally against Paul's teaching and Paul taught that salvation came from the grace of God. But the people at Philippi were smart enough to send for Paul and ask him to return and to clarify his doctrine. But because Paul was incarcerated and he couldn't come, they asked if he could send Timothy. Timothy was the presiding bishop 
at, at Ephesus so he couldn't come. And it's because of these circumstances that Paul writes the letter to the church that we now call Philippians. Just so you know. Doing it as a letter of encouragement and instruction. Now, today, beloved, for a few moments, we're going to preach and teach from the thought selective memory. Selective memory. Amen. Uh, I know some of you know what I'm talking about already. Folks have a tendency to forget. You see, it's human nature to remember what is pleasant and then try to forget what's painful. Yes. Pleasant memories that make us smile, we do recall them frequently. People, people have an abundance of these memories. People that have an abundance of these memories, they're generally happy people. Happy by nature. People who hold on to painful memories are usually by nature sad, ornery, and miserable people. But I submit to you today that you are in control of your memories. And you have the power, and you can choose to retain fond memories or retain hurtful ones. God has given us an example in the text that teaches us. That, that if we control our memories, we control our joy and our happiness. Yeah. Just look at somebody and tell them, say, I thank God for the memory. I thank God for the memory. And if you are a believer, this scripture reigns true. Romans 8 28 says, and we know that some things Work together for good yeah. for them that love the Lord. Yeah. Wait a minute. I, I didn't say that right. We know that something. Oh, oh, it's all. Huh? Oh, oh. All things work together for good for them that love the Lord. You got to make sure you know that and understand that. It's not just some of the things that you go through in your life that are meant. To elevate you and to make you better. But all things. Oh, yeah. If you're a believer. Yeah. All the everything yeah. that you go through. Yeah. Is intended to make you a better believer. Yeah. And I'm here to tell you today that you have the power. Yeah. To turn a memory that you held fast in the pain portion of your memory. You can turn it into a fine. And I can tell you, beloved, uh, with 100% accuracy that there is no pain or no struggle that God can't heal. Amen. You've got to train your mind to make your memories happy. You, you have the option to turn a sad event into a time of joy if you choose to. Well, Pastor, how can I do that? Well, it's in the text. After Paul's reading in verses 1 and 2, Paul immediately gives us something to think about. Paul says, uh, I hope you still have it open to Philippians, the first chapter, verse 3. Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Let me say that again. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Two things in the verse that make us think. Two things in the verse. Paul says, I thank my God. Right. Uh, uh, Paul is claiming that God belongs to him. Uh, Paul connects his spirit to God in a very personal way. Oh, beloved, it's all right to sing How Great Is Our God. Sister Slap, you know you can sing that song. But sometimes our prayer and our song should be mirror my God to thee. Or he is sweet, I know. Or my God is real. See, there's times in our walk, beloved, when we've got to take the generics off of God and make him up close and personal. Paul says, I thank my God. See, see, sometimes your relationship has to be so personal, you exclude yourself from church folks. 
You, you got to step away from those who claim to be worshipers but don't really have a relationship with God. Sometimes you got to separate yourself from those who claim to be believers but who really are just doing church. You got a whole lot of folks who are habitual churchgoers but they're just doing church. Uh, just like they do all of the other things that they do outside of church. See, you can tell folks who just do in church, but if there's another opportunity, church won't be done on that Sunday. See, folks who just do church don't have service as a priority. Church is a place that they go to because of routine, not a place that they go to to refill. I, I gotta tell you that when you stop doing church and become the church, it's no longer routine. It becomes required. So I don't you preach. See, worship is where you refill, where you refuel, and where you restore what you distribute in your ministry of living. And yes, your life is a ministry. How you live either encourages or discourages somebody. That's right. But I need to go just a little bit deeper. Can I go a little bit deeper and give you a comparison? Paul says, I thank my God. But in Ephesians 4 and 2, Paul says, he talks about forbearing in love. Mm. See, meaning that sometimes you got to bear with folks who are not where you are in the faith. But, but here in Philippians 1, Paul is taking a different tactic. Paul is saying, my God. He's not talking about bearing here. Paul is actually disconnecting from those who he's not sure they have the same faith. Uh, he's not sure they have the same love, the same baptism, and they don't have what Paul has. Paul separates himself because, see, we've got too many church folk who are barely believers, barely attending church, barely tithing, barely forgiving, and doing the bare minimum when it comes to obedience and sacrifice. Paul is not talking about forbearing and Philippians. Paul disconnects when they were not committed to the one true God. So the question is, why then does Paul feel the need to distinguish his God? Paul says, my God. Because he's all in, he ain't wishy-washy. Paul says, my God, because he's not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Part of Paul's reference to my God is because the people of Philippi, they were polytheistic. That means they had multiple gods. So Paul wants to make sure that the church knows he's talking about the God of history. My God. I wonder if I had any witnesses in here who don't pray to the God of Allah. Don't pray to Buddha, but you pray to your God. You have had to have some kind of relationship with him. He's had to be in your life. He's had to have move some things for you to be able to call him my God. Paul says, I thank my God, watch this, upon every remembrance of you. Let me say it again. Paul says, I thank my God upon every, every, somebody say every, remembrance of you. Got to stop, pull out the reference Bible. Here's why. Because the connecting scripture it's from the book of, of, of Acts 16. In Acts 16, we get the understanding of what happened at Paul's time in Philippi. And what's interesting is, Paul did not have a totally happy experience at Philippi. You see, Paul and Silas were trying to convert believers in Philippi, and there was a woman who was demon-possessed. And because of the spirit that was in Paul and Silas, she was attracted to him. Can I preach? And in fact, the Bible says that she followed them around. And, and she was crying out 
that they were uh, servants of God and that they were there to show folk the way of salvation. At this point, everywhere that Paul and Silas went, this woman was following them, that were following them and calling out who they were. Now, 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 let me give you a little bit more background. Because she was demon possessed, she used her spirit of divination to uh, tell fortunes. They call it soothsaying. She could tell fortunes. She had two men who were her handlers, and she made money for them. But after she followed Paul and Silas around for a long enough time, Paul got tired. Paul became frustrated, and he exercised the demon out of her. Problem is, after Paul did that, now she could no longer make money for the handlers, and they became angry. Uh, see, when you use it, somebody, and then somebody delivers them from that, now you can't use them no more. You don't get mad at them. You get mad at whoever delivered them. These men got mad at Paul and Cyrus, and Silas, and, and they, they, they arrested them, stripped their clothes off them, beat them, and placed them in prison. This all happened at Philippi. The Bible says that they were placed in the inner prison. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I believe it happened to any of us. I think we would register that first lady as a bad memory, amen? But <laughs> Paul says in the text, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. So we wonder, we say, Paul, you must have selective memory. <laughs> Paul, have you forgotten about your stalker? Had Paul forgotten about her handlers and had he forgotten about being stripped and beaten and has he forgotten about being put in stocks and has he forgotten about being detained in the innermost part of the prison? And none of these are good memories. But beloved, when we continue reading the 16th chapter of Acts, yeah. something happened while Paul and Silas were in prison. Now my Bible yeah. My Bible readers already know where I'm going, but I got to go there anyway. You see, the Bible says that at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. The Bible says that suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and all the doors were open and the bonds that were holding the prisoners were loose. And the keeper of the prison I mean, the man who was responsible yeah. for Paul and Silas thought that they and all the other prisoners were going to escape. The man became so upset that he was willing at that point to commit suicide. But Paul told him, he said, don't do yourself no harm. We're still here. Yeah. And the jailer got saved. And he was baptized. Not only him, but his whole family. See, see Paul remembered the, 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 his time in Philippi with a spirit of gratitude. Because yeah. God had delivered him and used him as a vessel to save the jailer in his family. So based on the text, beloved, Paul's memory of his time in Philippi had a happy ending, Doc Stevenson. So he turned being apprehended, turned being stalked, he turned being stripped and beaten. He turned being put in stocks and thrown in the bowels of prison. Paul turned on the negative part of, of the story when he thought about his experience in Philippi. He turned all of those negative things into positive yeah. negative. Paul focused on the praying and the singing. He focused on the earthquake. He focused on the bonds being broken. He focused on the other prisoners being set free. And he focused on saving and baptizing the jail. And his family. Paul remembered the good that came from his time. Watch this, beloved. The bad things that happened just made the good better. 
Somebody look at someone. Just, just, just touch two people and just say, my good days outweigh your bad days. And the stripes that Paul got, he can look at them as a good thing. Beloved, let me say something. The things that you go through that don't kill you make you strong. The things that you are able to endure that don't destroy you builds you up. They, I, I, I would guarantee that there's somebody here that has a scar to prove that you went through something. You still have the scar, but you don't have the problem there. And when you look at that scar, you don't think, oh my God, this is terrible. No, you think I got through it. I've got some scars, but I got through it. I'm going to look at that scar and make it turn it into a good memory yeah. that if I didn't have that scar, yeah. I might not be here. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Beloved, the things that make you cry, the things that break your heart, yeah. the things that mess with your mind, yeah. people that do you wrong, yeah. and every disappointment yeah. that you're still holding on to yeah. is just a portion of the testimony that you're going to end up because you will and the only reason why you're not rejoicing right now while you're getting the stars is because your story is still being written. The reason why you can't forget the pain now is because you're still living it. There's a reason why the old folk, Brother Luce, used to say, oh, we'll understand it better by and by. And let me help you with something. If you think Paul was stronger than you, and that's why he could turn bad memories into good ones, no, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. The scripture tells us. The scripture proves it. No, he wasn't. Watch this. If you continue to read in Acts 16, even after God delivers Paul and Silas out of prison, Paul's still angry. Paul is still mad. You know why? Because the pain is still fresh. And the reason why you haven't let go of that crossword that hurts your feelings is because you still in Philippi. You haven't had the time or the space uh, uh, to let go. You haven't had the time, the space to, to change that painful time to a memory of joy. I'm going to prove it to you. Watch this in Acts 16 when the magistrate decides to let Paul and Silas go. You know what Paul said? No. He said, no, no, don't let me go because you beat me in public. You put me in prison in public. You stripped me in public. So no, don't let me go in private. Let me go in public just like you beat me. But here's what I'm going to tell you. Y'all, 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 maybe y'all shouldn't have clapped it there. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Sometimes the hurt is public, but the apology is private. When I think about Paul and the stand that he made about staying in prison, I, I, I'm going to be honest, I don't think I could have done that. I was at the Paul said, oh, we can go? All right. All right, cellmates, I'll see y'all later. <laughs> oh, we'll keep you in prayer. Paul was mad, still mad, even after he had the ability to go. Couldn't let go. You know why? He was too close to the moment in order to see, couldn't see God's movement. Sometimes you've got to get out of the moment in order to see God's movement. <laughs> Now, there are three things that you need in order to forget your pain. Three things you need in order to forget your pain. Three things you need in order to forget your pain. You need time. You need space. And experience. Time, space, and experience. With Paul, uh, you got to fast forward that. 
When Paul is in prison now, when he's writing this apostle, he, this is, this is uh, 10 years later, ten, enough time has passed now that Paul can, can disconnect from the pain. He can disconnect from the memory of the beating and the embarrassment. And it's enough for him to shift the bad things into a good memory. Ten years later, Paul could look at that beat and look at those stars and say, hey, I was able to save that family. <coughs> so yeah, yeah, I got the virus, but I was able to plant a church. Ten years later, Paul writes to the church at Philippi. So the time, Paul had time to get over what happened to him. So he changed there's enough time to change that memory from a bad one to a good one. Now watch this. Paul wrote the, the, this prison epistle in Rome. Rome is almost 800 miles from Philippi. What's that? He had space. He had disconnected. He was far enough away. Now he wasn't so close that he couldn't, uh, he couldn't see past what was happening to him at the time. And then after this time, 10 minutes later, Paul has been beaten a few more times. He's been stoned. He's been put in prison. He's been shipwrecked. Uh, he's been left for dead. All of these things have happened. Paul now has experience. So what happened to him at Philippi? That's just what happens when you minister. I understand. That's just part of what goes on. Now he has experience. So now he has time. It's 10 years later. He has space. He's, he's 800 miles away. And he's had the experience of similar things happening. And he made it through. So now those memories that were painful at the time, he's turned them into good memories. He's used his selective memory. And here's how you can tell when you have spiritual growth and experience. Here's how you can tell. Watch this. When you're able to cut folk off when they're apologizing to you, yeah, yeah. When, when, when you're able to cut them off and say, oh, baby, don't worry, I forgot. I forgot you even said that. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, you know what? I, I forgot that even happened. Well, well, Brother Thomas, I, no, wait, wait, wait. You know what? What you talking about? I don't even remember that. Here's the words you need to add to your vocabulary. Don't worry about it because I'm over that. Amen. You need to have that in your vocabulary. Instead of holding on to something, tell somebody, don't worry about it. I'm, I'm, I'm already past that. I need y'all to practice. Y'all ain't going to say it. Amen. <laughs> Practice it, practice it. Say, look, say, here's, 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 here's an even more biblical way to do it. Look at somebody right now and say, I prayed about it, I prayed about and, it. I'm over. and I'm over it. Yeah. Beloved, we got to be like Paul and just erase some things from our memories. Amen? Amen. We, we got to be able to just take some things and say, you know, I'm, I'm not even going to dwell on this. I know it happened, but I know that all things work together for good for them that love the Lord and all are according to his purpose. I'm not going to hold on to this pain because, you know what? I can get past this thing. I'm going to pray on it, and then I'm going to be done with it. I'm going to put it on an altar, and then I'm going to let it go. I'm going to breathe. And I'm going to give myself enough time and enough space. And in the meantime, while I'm giving time and space, I know I'm going to go through some more things. So how can I hold on to that thing? I'm trying to help you with your memory. Got to make that memory selective. Here the other day I was put together video and it's on my computer and the computer said little window popped up and said there's not enough space 
on your desk to complete this task. Oh, okay. I know it. I'm gonna keep on. I'm gonna argue. I ain't worried about that. Kept going. A few minutes later. Not enough space on your disk to complete this task. The second time it came up, it came up with another little window and it said, Here's some suggested actions. <laughs> and the suggested action, two suggested actions, one of them was you can delete some seldom used files. Or you can delete some unnecessary files. Y'all, y'all not, y'all not still with me. It says you can delete some seldom used files, or you can delete some unnecessary files. And I kind of applied that to what we do as believers. See, some, some folk need to delete some seldom used files so you can make some room so that you can complete the task that you have. Let me, let me help you. If you're still holding on to that file of hate, you need to delete that file.
said, because you have removed these vows, now you need to reboot. to forgive you because I already forgave you. 